grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a trick question. <laughs> the lawyer asked Jesus, which commandment is the greatest? Now I have seen enough courtroom TV dramas to know when there's a setup. <laughs> and the lawyer asked the witness who saw on the stand a question and it's meant to entrap the witness. These trick questions, they're meant to steer you in the wrong direction. So like, here's a question. Before Mount Everest was discovered, what was the tallest mountain above sea level? Was it Mount Kilimanjaro or Mount McKinley? Answer, Mount Everest. It just hadn't been discovered yet. <laughs> or how about this? Um, what's happening on Tuesday? Halloween. So you go to the store and you buy 20 full-size Kit Kat bars because you're that household that has the full-size bars. And you put those 20 bars in the basket and the door rings and there are 20 children one by one who come and to each child you give a Kit Kat bar. And yet, at the end, there is one Kit Kat bar in the basket. How does it happen? Answer, you gave the last child the basket. <laughs> oh my God, this is so much fun. I'm gonna do another one. <laughs> okay, okay. So, your loved one dies and they weren't so good when they lived on earth. And so they didn't get into heaven. What can you do to free them from their eternal fate? Now that sounds as silly as all the other trick questions, and yet this trick question, it was a powerful one. 500 years ago, in the 1500s, this was a live question that people genuinely worried about. Like today, we worry about life insurance for after we die, the people who live. Back then, they worried about after life insurance. What happened to the people after they died? And so the church offered some insurance for this. They called it papal indulgences that you could purchase them from your local state farm agent, I mean clergy, and you could then allow your loved one to be freed from purgatory, which was the holding place for those Christians who weren't good enough to get into heaven and had a lot of work to do in order to get to the pearly gates. And they even had a catchy slogan for this. Purchase an indulgence, and when a coin in the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs. Now, a trick question from 500 years ago doesn't seem very relevant to us today, but this one was. Because the person who recognized this question was a setup, was a young priest who forever changed the landscape of Christendom, and one could argue, the nations of the world. 500 years ago on Tuesday, October 31st, 1517, a 33-year-old Augustinian monk named Martin Luther supposedly went up the steps of his church and nailed to the door 95 sentences or theses criticizing the church's practice of indulgence and starting a firestorm that spread throughout Europe and throughout beyond Europe and the world that we now call the Protestant Reformation. And it was all because he recognized it was a trick question. Why would you need to get something to get into heaven? Because 
God already sent Jesus Christ to save us from my sins. And we don't require something special to get into heaven. God's done the work. And to believe otherwise is akin to believing Mount Kilimanjaro is the tallest mountain. It's simply not true. Nothing anyone bought or said or did could get the place, take the place of what Jesus Christ bought or said and did. We cannot do it for ourselves. Jesus has done it for us. We can't make ourselves or anyone good enough or righteous enough to appear before God with our actions that we undertake. We need Jesus to do that. Or, to paraphrase, what St. Paul said in the book of Galatians. We don't nullify the grace of God because if righteousness can be accomplished by our actions, Christ died in vain. Now, Luther did not always trust in the grace of God. In fact, his uh, vision of God matched the one of those who sought and bought and sold indulgences. He imagined God as an angry judge who would look upon Luther's wretched life and his miserable way of being and count the number of ways that he kept screwing up. And Luther always felt that God was displeased with him. And he always fell short of what God expected from him. Have you ever felt worthy or less than worthy of God's love? Have you felt like you actually deserved God to be disappointed in you and God had disdain for you? I imagine it's akin to someone in your life you may have whose approval you are eager to seek and that person is always dissatisfied with you do y'all have somebody like that in your life it is maddening and debilitating and painful when someone consistently and openly disapproves of you. It's more so when it's God. So the church offered a way to deal with this God who was displeased with you. Confession and penance. Luther was assigned a father confessor, a brilliant, kind, and wise monk named Johann von Stopitz. And um, Luther took advantage of the fact that Stopitz was um, responsible to hear his confession, and he would keep Stopitz in confession for hours. One time it was six hours. And unfortunately, Luther's sins weren't that interesting. (laughs) Finally, uh, Stopitz had it. And one time when Luther came to confess, Stopitz said to Luther, oh my goodness, stop feeling guilty and just love God. To which Luther quickly responded, I don't love God, I hate God. And of course he hated God, as did everyone back then. Because this was a God that they thought you had to earn God's love. You had to do something to win God's favor. You could not receive forgiveness unless you had action and repentance to follow it and merit it. Because nobody can measure up to God's standards. Now you and I may shake our heads and wonder how anyone can feel that way about God. And yet there are still people today, Christians, who claim that you have to do something You have to do something to get right with God or God will be angry with you. That you have to go to the right denomination or confess the right things or refuse to engage in certain acts or ways of being or 
act a little bit more holy or give a little more or else God will abandon you. And instead of believing in the grace of God, they believe in the wrath of God. But can I tell you, the children of this church know who this God is. So as the priest who's in charge of the face of the children in use, I take my job very seriously and I try as many times as I can to confirm that they love Jesus and so I give them a trick question. I set up a scenario. I say, oh, there's a person who cheated. Or there's a person who lied. There's a person who stole. Oh, there's this person who's so mean and not very innocent, nobody likes them. Now, little child, Jesus loves you, we know that. But Jesus doesn't love that other person, right? It is my joy to inform you, I have yet to trick a child in this church because they know that Jesus cannot help but love liars and cheaters and stealers and mean people and Pharisees and thieves and adulterers and tax collectors and yes, even lawyers. So when that lawyer asks this question, which of the commandment is the greatest, he knows it's a trick question because he believed in an exacting God, a righteous God who is going to execute judgment when you break the law. And so the answer to the question is every law is the greatest because you break one, you merit punishment. But Jesus, the heart of God knows the answer to this trick question. Know who God is and you will know what the commandments really mean. God has made it clear through Jesus Christ God loves us. God saves us. God cares for us. This God is not to be feared or pacified. This God is to be loved. And the commandments are meant to help you do just that. Brothers and sisters, our delight is to remember that the gospel of Jesus Christ states unequivocally that God acted first, saving us from every fear that keeps up us up at night, everything that terrorizes our conscience, every demon that threatens to undo us, and those voices that fuel our insecurities. We have nothing to be afraid of because as Martin Luther penned in his famous him, a mighty fortress is our God. Jesus Christ has done the work of reconciliation between us and God. Our debts have been paid. What other response can we have to this except to love God and to love everyone God made with this like overflowing, lavish, free, like I can't believe I don't have to do anything because God did it all for me through Jesus Christ's love. And this abundant love, well, it just pours out from all your pores all over everybody. Poor, the rich, the gay, the straight, the trans, the queer, black, white, Democrats, Republicans, janitors, execs, stay-at-home moms, everybody. This extravagant love molds and marks all of our actions regardless of anyone's reaction. Your love cannot be overpowered because you're operating out of the loving kindness of God. So one more trick question. 
So let's say God loves you, right? And you who are made in the image of God, love God and love everybody around you, who then is fulfilling the great commandments? Is it you or is it God in you? Answer, yes. Yes. 